Assalamu alaikum, Amin here. Welcome to the Sira Masters Show, lifestyle design for the ambitious Ummah. Check out siramasters.com. Now let's get into this episode. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Muhammad here with the ultimate guide to a Muslim's motivation, part one. How do I get and stay motivated long enough to achieve my goals? Here's the thing changing a habit, waking up early to pray, being healthy putting in time to study and being more productive are all things we love the sound of. But you know, as well as I do, that in order to actualize these things, we need to take consistent action. Consistent action will drive you to your goal, but consistent action requires consistent motivation. You may have set important goals in the past, Perhaps you've committed to making some serious change in your life, but have you ever felt that you just lost motivation? One of the biggest challenges I've personally faced has been sustaining motivation. I mean, it's pretty easy to get motivated for something in the beginning, right? But how do you keep that passion and energy alive day in and day out? How do you keep on striving even when you don't feel like it? For the past few years, I've been asking myself these exact questions. I've obsessively learnt about the subject of motivation and tried to put what I've learnt into practice. Based on what I've learnt and the little experience I've gained, I've put together all the information and action points needed to get motivated. I hope that the following discussion can be the ultimate guide on getting and staying motivated. What I mean by the ultimate guide is that after this guide, you won't need to read more on the topic. You can if you want to, but you won't need to. If you want to become a professor in motivational psychology, you'll definitely need to read more. But if, like the rest of us, you want results based on simple, straightforward strategies that are tried and tested, then this guide contains everything you need to start taking action. Wait, so what is motivation anyway? If each of your goals was a destination, then different resources would be different vehicles and motivation would be your fuel. Depending on how far you are from your destination and how many challenges you'll have to overcome in order to get there, you may choose to walk to your destination on an empty stomach, or perhaps you'll take a car with a tank full of petrol, or even get a plane. Motivation is the energy that keeps you going until you reach your goals. It's what pushes you when you face challenges. It's the reason someone may get up early or stay up late. In fact, All of human behaviour is driven by some sort of motivation. Humans are very simply motivated by either perceived pleasure or perceived pain. We seek to move towards what we believe is pleasurable and away from what we believe to be painful. All our behaviour is a tug of war between these two forces. It's like the carrot and the stick. You move towards the carrot and away from the stick. When your motivation for the carrot goes down, your fear of the stick drives you to keep going. This is the sunnah of Allah, his way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala motivates us with paradise and hellfire, pleasure and pain. If Allah only motivated us with paradise, we would lack motivation when we were feeling complacent. And if he subhanahu wa ta'ala only motivated us with hellfire, we would despair and lose hope when we made mistakes. Our love for Allah rests on both hope in his mercy and fear of his punishment. We keep motivated through the desire to earn Allah's paradise and the fear of earning his wrath. But all of our relationships are based on the same sunnah. 
our relationships with our parents, friends, studies, health and fitness, etc. Imagine you have a very important exam. An exam that is so important that if you pass, you graduate from university. But if you fail, you have to repeat the whole year. Also, imagine that you find pleasure in resting in bed, which might not be too hard. Now, imagine you have to wake up early for that exam. How likely do you think it would be that you'd wake up early? Would it be more likely than if you had a super boring lecture where they didn't even take attendance? Why? Because there's more pleasure associated with passing than the pleasure associated with sleeping in. Or maybe there's more pain associated with failing than the pain associated with sacrificing a little sleep. Or maybe both. Whilst we are motivated by both pain and pleasure, pain is a strong motivation in the short term and pleasure is a much, much, much stronger motivation in the mid to long term. You can only be forced to do something you don't want to do for so long. You see, running away from pain is like running away from a dog. You'll only run far enough that the dog can't catch you anymore. But you won't keep running after that. This is where pleasure comes in. The dog is a great way to force you to start moving and even build momentum. But there has to be something that keeps you moving. There has to be something you keep moving towards. You have to have some perceived pleasure that keeps you going once the dog is out of sight. Surely if motivation was that important, it would be in the Qur'an and Sunnah. There is so much in the Islamic tradition, whether that be in the Qur'an and Sunnah or the works of Islamic scholars on the subject of motivation and having high aspirations. However, there's a handful of very comprehensive ahadith that I personally believe summarize this whole discussion. The first, and perhaps my favourite, is a hadith found in Al-Bukhari and narrated by Abu Huraira. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam taught us that whoever believes in Allah and his apostle offers prayers perfectly and fasts Ramadan, then it is incumbent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to admit him into paradise, whether he emigrates for Allah's cause or stays in the land he was born. The companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, asked, O oh Allah's Messenger, وسلم, should we not inform the people of that? The Prophet وسلم, replied with a statement meaning, there are 100 degrees in paradise which Allah has prepared for those who carry jihad in his cause. The distance between every two degrees is like the distance between the sky and the earth. So if you ask Allah for anything, ask him for al-firdaus. For it is the last part of paradise and the highest part of paradise. And at its top, there is the throne of the beneficent. And from it, gush forth the rivers of paradise. Wow. What is amazing about this hadith is that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, tells us how we can enter paradise, how we can just enter by doing our obligations. But rather than stopping there, he وسلم, continued and told us that if we ask Allah, we should ask for al-firdaus. The highest level of paradise. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, didn't tell us that, well, since it's incumbent upon us to enter Jannah, we should only ask for Jannah. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, didn't even say, well, there's 100 degrees of Jannah and we all have different abilities and different capabilities, so aim for whatever you can. But rather... He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us about one of the noblest deeds in our religion. And then sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he commanded us to ask for the highest level of Jannah. 
So we've been taught to aim high, really high, to aim for the best. But if you're going to ask Allah for something that great, that high in the hereafter, you have to be aiming to do some pretty lofty stuff in this life to get you there. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that Allah loves lofty matters and superiority and hates inferior matters. So do you want to be beloved to Allah? Do you want your life goals and ambitions to be beloved to Allah? Or do you want your life goals and ambitions to be disliked by Allah? We should really ask ourselves, are my ambitions lofty? Am I the best at what I do? Or do I have goals and a life that are mediocre and inferior? I mean, even if we have pretty lofty ambitions and do everything to a superior standard, we can still ask ourselves, do we want to be even more beloved to Allah? If we do, then very simply we need to aim even higher and strive even harder to be even more superior. Now, there is a hadith that comes to mind, a hadith that is often quoted and misunderstood. In fact, I personally misunderstood this hadith for a long time until I asked one of my teachers about it. So once a Bedouin with messy hair came up to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him, O oh Allah's Messenger wasallam." Inform me of what Allah has made compulsory for me with regards to the prayer. The Prophet Muhammad taught him, you have to offer perfectly the five compulsory prayers in a day and night, unless you want to pray nawafil, i.e. optional deeds. The Bedouin further asked, inform me what Allah has made compulsory for me with regards to fasting. The Prophet ﷺ taught him that he has to fast during the whole month of Ramadan unless he wants to pray more as nawafil, i.e. optional fasts. The Bedouin further asked, Tell me how much zakat Allah has enjoined upon me. Thus, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ taught him about all the rules, the fundamentals of Islam. The Bedouin concluded by saying, by him who has honoured you, I will neither perform any nawafil, i.e. additional deeds, nor will I decrease what Allah has enjoined upon me, i.e. my obligations. The Messenger of Allah replied with a statement, the meaning of which is, if he is saying the truth, he will, su he will succeed, or he will be granted paradise. Now, this hadith would make the reader assume that you don't have to aim very high. I mean, it's enough to just fulfill your obligations and get to paradise. But we mentioned earlier that the Prophet ﷺ also taught us to aim for the highest level of paradise. The reality is that this hadith actually encouraged us to aim very high. And there's a valuable lesson to be taken from this hadith. My teacher explained that the Bedouin, according to some who explained the hadith, was a new Muslim. He was also a Bedouin, which despite being pretty obvious, explains a lot. As a new Muslim, the religion of Islam and its commands can be quite overwhelming. And so for this new Muslim wanting to know the obligations and committing to do every single one of them is actually a huge deal. I mean, just remembering how to make wudu can be a big challenge for a new Muslim. So this Bedouin was actually very motivated. Rather than feeling disheartened and overwhelmed, he took on the challenge and committed to all the obligations of Islam. The Bedouin was also a Bedouin which I know is pretty obvious, but it's actually a very important point. The Bedouins were some of the most difficult people when Islam came to them. They were anarchic. They weren't used to an imposed system or an organized way of life. They were rebellious and nomadic in their nature, and they only cared about their animals. 
So for a Bedouin to submit to a higher authority and commit to a set of fixed practices, put their animals aside and their hectic, crazy, unorganized lives aside to do something like pray and fast is actually very impressive. If anything, this story is an evidence for motivation and not one against it. This hadith also teaches us that motivation is subjective. We are all at different stages on our journey. You have to be motivated. Very motivated. You have to aim high. Very high. But high for me is not the same as high for you. And it's not the same as high for someone who started their journey 10 years before both of us. There are so many factors that influence what motivation means to different people. We need to accept and respect that. We also need to tailor our discourse appropriately when we're talking to different people. When you are teaching a new Muslim how to pray, it's unwise to start teaching them about the voluntary night prayer, Qiyam al-Layl. Let them first learn how to make wudu and pray. Then let them make a habit of praying and taste the sweetness of prayer. Then you can take them to the next level. All of this talk about motivation and lofty ambitions is just amazing and inspiring. But isn't this only with the deen? Okay, so check this out. Once Abdullah ibn Umar عنهمar, was sitting in front of the Kaaba with some of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and he said, wish for something. So the companions started wishing for different things. One companion said, I wish to be in charge of the Khilafah. Another companion said, I wish that people take knowledge from me. Another said, I wish I can be in charge of Iraq. And then Abdullah ibn Umar said, as for me, I wish for forgiveness from Allah. What I find about this story, which is so amazing, is that the companions were so different. They had different ambitions. Some inclined towards serving Islam through political leadership. Others sought to do so through knowledge. And some were so concerned with earning Allah's forgiveness that everything else was just insignificant. I often find brothers and sisters thinking of being practicing and being upon the sunnah and the way of the companions in a very robotic way. If you sit with one group, they seem to think that aiming high is just becoming a scholar and every other goal is just insignificant. However, it's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Jannah has different gates. Some of us will, inshallah, enter Jannah through the gates of prayer, whilst others through the gates of fasting or constraining anger or striving in the way of Allah. Some will enter through the gates of charity. Striving generally requires health and giving charity generally requires money. Some of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, were so aware of the importance of having finance in Islam that they actually complained to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. They said, Ya Rasulullah, dhahaba ahlu duthuri bil ujuri, meaning, O oh Messenger of Allah, the wealthy people have taken all of the rewards. They went on to explain that the rich companions prayed and fasted in the same way that they did, but on top of that, they gave charity. The poorer companions were of course very conscious of how being poor meant they were missing out big time. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as was his habit of course, left no room for excuses and went on to offer solutions. He وسلم, told them of various ways they could accumulate reward. We of course know that intention plays a massive role in how we're rewarded. So, for example, somebody who donates one pound could get more reward if they're sincere than somebody else who donates a thousand pounds. But what about somebody who donates a million pounds and is more sincere than both of them? What about someone who utilizes all the things the Prophet ﷺ advised the poor companions to do and then tops it off with giving loads of money to charity and is sincere in the process? By the way, do you remember the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who wished for different things in front of the Kaaba? Well, guess what? This is amazing, right? It's been narrated that every single one of them got what they wished for. And it's hoped that Abdullah ibn Umar will be forgiven. Inshallah. So they wished for something 
and it became true. Obviously, we know that something happened in between them wishing and it coming true. They had to take some action, but the point is they wished for something and it came true. They wished for big things and they came true. When was the last time you wished for something big? I mean something as big as being the Khalifa or a leading scholar for the Muslims to benefit from. There are so many stories and narrations that we can quote regarding the importance of knowledge, finance and health in Islam. But it suffices us to realize that we must be motivated and ambitious and have lofty goals. These goals would differ from person to person. For some of us, we will have amazing goals with our studies. For others, it will suffice to study the foundations of the religion, but will aim sky high when it comes to business and charity. Others will make health and fitness their priority. Some of us, inshallah, will master and aim sky high in all of these areas. Okay, cool. So how do I actually get motivated? Well, there's a few strategies for motivation. And I've actually found that a lot of these strategies mentioned by modern psychologists and personal development gurus resemble things that have been said by Islamic scholars and in the Islamic tradition. This actually comes as absolutely no surprise to me because Allah's laws are universal. Allah's laws are universal. I mean, gravity is a creation of Allah. It's also one of Allah's laws and it's universal. It doesn't matter what your religion is. Gravity pulls you in a certain direction. Now you can live your life using that to your advantage or you can try and resist it. Similarly, Allah's laws for success are universal. The more of these laws you live by, the more successful you'll be. Again, no matter what religion you are, these laws will pull you in a certain direction. And you can live life utilizing that direction and taking that to your advantage or you can try and resist it. Based on sources that are rooted in Islam and sources that are just rooted on research and experience, some of the most effective motivational strategies are the following. Number one, effective goal setting. Number two, knowing and pondering over the positive and negative consequences of your actions, then anchoring perceived pleasure and pain to the action. Number three, your beliefs, your beliefs about Allah your beliefs about the dunya, the worldly life, and your beliefs about the akhir or hereafter, and your beliefs about yourself. Number four, knowing how to properly make dua and then consistently doing so. Number five, using empowering language with yourself and other people. Number six, being consistent and developing powerful habits. This also includes replacing negative habits. Number seven, finding positive role models. Throughout the rest of this guide, inshallah, we will be looking at the above strategies. And by the end of the series, bi'idhnillah, you will have a very strong understanding of what these strategies actually mean, their importance and how to practically utilize these strategies for maximum benefit. But for now, just take a moment and think about some of the prophetic sayings mentioned above. Really let them sink in and think about them. Also try and honestly answer the following questions. Do you ask Allah for Al-Firdaus? Have you set goals that will get you to Al-Firdaus? Are you taking the means and putting in the necessary action to get you to Al-Firdaus? Do you want to be beloved to Allah or disliked by Allah? Do you want to be lofty and superior or inferior? Are your mindset, beliefs, goals lofty and superior? Is your life lofty and superior? And which gate or gates of Jannah do you want to enter through? What actions do you think you need to do in order to enter Jannah through those gates? And based on the above questions, what goals do you want to set to get you through those gates? Next time, inshallah, we'll be continuing the series, taking it to another level and looking at goal setting, inshallah ta'ala. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Thanks for checking out this episode. Please do take 30 seconds to give us an honest review. It really does help. To find out all our blog posts, videos, and resources on Islamic lifestyle design, go to siramasters.com. S double E R A masters.com. Until next time, Hayakum Allah. Where are you, Bali? Yalla, yalla, yalla.